Hi everyone, welcome back to the immunology series. This is the eighth lecture in this series. Now, last time we looked at how B cells are activated and the functions and types of different antibodies. In this lecture, we will continue to look at other aspects of antibodies in terms of their structure and how they get the diversity and conclude that with a brief overview of the application of therapeutic antibodies. So let's get started. This lecture can be broken down into three main themes. Number one, antibody structure and binding characteristics. Number two, how antibodies attain diversity. And three, applications of antibodies. When we describe antibodies, generally speaking, they have high affinity and specificity toward their antigens or specific epitope of a given antigen. The high affinity means they bind very tight to the target, and high specificity means they will only bind to that given antigen and nothing else. High specificity is a good feature because that means it will have a less off-target effect. But if an antigen mutates very rapidly or outpace vaccine development, for example, for the given antigen, then we will see the loss of binding of that antibody. Now here is an example to show you the specificity of different antibody. Now on the left panel here, we have a fluorescently labeled anti-A antibody. It only binds to antigen A, but not antigen B and D, and it shows up green in the upper left-hand corner block. Now, even though antigen A, B, and D share 80% similarity in their protein sequences, uh, it doesn't show light up. Now, likewise, similar effects are seen in anti-B antibody that lights up against antigen B, and anti-D antibody lies up against antigen D. Now let's look at the antibody structure more closely. When we treat antibodies with an enzyme called a pepin, the enzyme can digest the hinge of each heavy chain and reduce the disulfide bonds that connect the two hinges. This yields three fragments two Fab fragments that can bind to the antigen, and a Fc fragment that can be crystallized in the experiment. Another notable feature of the hinge region is that it is flexible in some way. This allows the antibody to bind with both arms or the forks to many different arrangements of antigens on the surface of pathogens. The graph here shows three different antibodies bind with both arms to antigens at different distance apart. Last time we mentioned the differences between the five antibody isotypes were based on the different FC regions. Now, in fact, the FC region also defines antibody functional capability. For example, the FC region of IgG binds to FC gamma receptor on phagocytes and participates in opsonization. And in comparison, the FC region of IgE binds to FC epsilon receptors on mast cells and leads to sensitization and degranulation during an allergic reaction. Now let's take a look at the antibody structure from the chain standpoint. Both the light chain and the heavy chain contains variable and constant regions. The variable regions from both the light chain and heavy chain participate in antigen binding. We also have another name for the antigen binding region, that is hypervariable regions, because it is the area with the greatest diversity of amino acids and the greatest diversity of chemical reactivity possible. So the reactivity is determined by the different amino acid side chains that is associated with the hypervariable region. And because of the different amino acid side chain, it will determine the different non-covalent forces or interactions between the binding region and the antigen. Now, these non-covalent forces include electrostatic forces, hydrogen bond, van der Waal forces, and hydrophobic forces. In a general sense, we say the antibody binds to the antigen. 
but more precisely, the antibody binds to the epitope of a given antigen. When antibodies can bind to the outer surface component of a pathogen, they can participate in neutralization action or opsonization. Now that's when they are most useful. Remember, antibody can bind to a variety of biomolecules such as glycoproteins, polysaccharides, glycolipids, and peptidoglycans on the pathogen surface. When a given antigen has several of the same recognizable epitopes that are repeatedly present, we call it multivalent repeater. When an antigen has different recognizable epitopes, we call it multivalent varied. Now, when we look closer at the binding action, a linear epitope can provide more binding interaction with the variable region in the left-hand side graph. And in contrast, a discontinuous epitope provides less contact points and a weaker binding between the two. In addition of the interaction surface, which often determine the affinity, the three-dimensional shape or 3D shape of the antigen can also determine the specificity. Now, the concept is not so different from a lock and key mechanism. Here are the examples of a small compact antigen that can sneak into a small binding site on the variable region. And the second graph here is a shallow groove. And the third graph is an extended surface. And lastly, is an epitope that is a pocket that allows a protrude hypervariable region to interact with. We have just looked at antibody structure and binding characteristics. Now let's take a look at how antibodies attain diversity. Our body regularly manipulates DNA in order to generate a B cell or immunoglobulin diversity through three major mechanisms. Number one is somatic recombination. Number two is junctional diversity. And three, somatic hypermutation. And we'll look at these mechanisms in the next few slides. Before we look at the specific mechanisms, we need to be aware that antibody diversity is generated at the gene level, and there are multiple gene complexes in the DNA that codes for different parts of the antibody. These gene complexes are designated with letters V, D, J, and C. The light chain variable region contains V and J gene complexes, and the heavy chain variable regions contain V, D, and J gene complexes. Both chains have the C complex that codes for the constant regions. And there are two additional complexes in the heavy chain that codes for the constant region of either secreted or membrane-bound antibodies. Now let's use the heavy chain to illustrate the somatic recombination process. During somatic recombination, cutting and splicing action happens during which the non-coding or intervening DNA regions are cut out and the VDJ complexes are joined subsequently. The same process also happens with the light chain. The only difference is that there is no D complex in the light chain gene. And this process is mediated by a group of enzymes called recombinase. The second mechanism that can introduce diversity is called junctional diversity. Now, this happens when joining the VJ or DJ gene complexes. When recombinase cuts DNA with, uh, it cuts with overhanging ends, shown in the middle figure there, and additional nucleotides such as A, T, G, or C may be introduced or lost during the joining process between the gene complex. Now, this process generates more variety at the junction of the gene complexes. That is junctional diversity. Now, junctional diversity and random combinations of heavy and light chains increase overall antibody diversity by a factor of 3 times 10 to the 7th. That is a lot.
In addition to splicing and joining of gene complexes, alternative splicing of mRNA is an additional method to further increase the diversity of the final protein product. Previously, we talked about naive B cells have both membrane-bound IgD and IgM on their surfaces. Both isotypes have the same variable region, but with different FC regions. The mechanism for generating two isotypes on the same cell is through alternative splicing of messenger RNA. Now, first, the primary RNA transcript that is first transcribed from DNA uh, will be a single piece of long RNA. And that piece of long RNA will be further spliced differently to generate different final mRNA script that code for either IgD or IgM. After B cells activation, B cell will differentiate into plasma cells. Now they initially secrete soluble forms of IgM and IgD, but mostly IgM. The same alternative RNA splicing process can remove MC regions that code for the hydrophobic region anchoring the antibody to the B cell surface. This generates a script that contains a secretable form of the constant region, the SC region, that ultimately gets translated into soluble forms of antibodies. Isotype switching also involves recombination between different switch regions, during which the antigen-binding VDJ segments are preserved. The genetic spaces between C genes are flanked or spaced out by the switch region designated with an S there. Now, the gene recombination process eliminates some of the G C genes variants and eventually going from one antibody isotype to another. The third mechanism that alters the antibody composition is somatic hypermutation that primarily occurs in the antigen-binding hypervariable region. This is actually a random process that happens during B cell proliferation. During the rapid B cell division process, mistakes sometimes happen and uracil is introduced into the DNA strand. This is not normal, and it has to be corrected in order for the DNA replication to continue to happen. So DNA repair enzymes comes in and remove uracil and replace it with either A, T, G, or C at random. So the antigen binding domain is altered that way. The altered antigen binding domain may or may not have a higher affinity for a given antigen. But after the clonal selection and proliferation process, only those B cells with higher affinity binding antibodies will proliferate and differentiate into plasma cells. Now, as an immune response matures, the affinity of antibodies for pathogen becomes progressively greater. So, in that case, the affinity is matured. Now we are switching gear again a little bit to cover artificial manipulations of DNA to generate antibodies for experimental or therapeutic purposes. As early as in 1895, there were reports and experiments of using horse anti-serum prepared by immunizing various animals with a, a mixture of two preparations of mycobacterial uh, substance to treat tuberculosis. Now, in their experiments of 412 TB patients, more than half had significant improvement or complete recovery because getting of getting that serum. Now, we have to understand that having TB in 1895 was like a death sentence for many patients. So this serum therapy at the time was revolutionary and highly successful. But using non-human proteins or antibodies as a therapy can produce type 3 hypersensitivity, 
which is characterized by generating IgG antibodies against those foreign proteins. Now, that will lead to immune complexes formation, precipitation, and the position in tissues. Now, ultimately lead to activations of the complement and other innate immune response, and those are characterized by two major types of reaction. One is called Arthur's reaction, which is characterized by a local redness and injection site reactions, and more seriously, it would lead to serum sickness, which is a systematic or systemic reaction. Before the advancement of recombinant DNA technologies, that generate modern monoclonal antibodies that are used for diagnostics and therapeutics. Antibodies were generated using animals. Traditionally, animals such as rabbits, goats, and mice, rats, are immunized with the antigen of interest, and it usually require multiple doses to generate a enough immune response. After about 7 to 11 weeks, a couple months, the animal blood is collected and the plasma containing antibodies are isolated. Now, these antibodies are usually polyclonal, which means they are a mixture of antibodies against a specific antigen, but each recognizing a different epitope or region of the antigen. Now, when we get vaccinated, we also generate polyclonal antibodies against the antigen that is in the vaccine. The bottom here are just some examples of therapeutic polyclonal antibodies that target multiple T cell antigens. These therapeutic polyclonal antibodies are used as immunosuppressants to suppress transplant rejections through inhibition of antigen presentation and diapedesis. These days, we more commonly hear the term monoclonal antibody. The early monoclonal antibodies were produced by a cell line called hybridoma. In the mid-70s of the 20th century, scientists first fused B lymphocytes with immortal cancer myeloma cells to produce a cell line which was both immortal and a producer of specific antibodies. The, these two scientists were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1984 for the development of this hybridoma. Now, each hybridoma produces a relatively large quantity of identical antibody molecules. By allowing the hybridoma to multiply in a culture in a petri dish, it is possible to produce a population of cells, each of which produces identical antibody molecules. Now, these antibodies are called monoclonal antibodies because they are produced by the identical offspring of a single cloned antibody producing cell. Now, once a monoclonal antibody is made, it can be used as a specific probe to track down and purify the specific protein that is used in its transformation or formation. Now, the value of hypertoma to the field was not truly appreciated until about 1987 when monoclonal antibodies were regularly produced in rodents for diagnostics and now we are more using it for therapeutic as well. And more recently, genetic engineering is utilized to humanize antibodies or create fusion proteins. Now, it is a process that deliberately modifies an organism's genetic information by directly changing its genome. It is accomplished by the method collectively known as recombinant DNA technology, the basic strategy of which is to move the gene of interest from one genome to another, utilizing in vitro recombinations of DNA molecules. Now, we will talk more about this process or this technology in our biotechnology series, so wait for that. So when scientists fuse a human protein 
with a mouse protein. This new protein or this new feature we usually refer to with a name called Chimera. Now, Chimera is a combination protein. In this case, many cases it would be a combination of a mouse variable regions with a human FC or C regions. Now, just a note for you that Chimera it's a mystery type of a animal that is described as a fire breathing. She monster with a lion head and a goat's body, and a serpent's tail depicted in this picture. And for those of you who watch animation, specifically Spy Family,、uh, the character girl Anya, her stuffed animal is a chimera. So just a note. And what you're looking here are the examples of therapeutic antibodies that are monoclonal antibodies. Notice that initially we had mouse antibodies, and eventually we are fusing more and more human part, forming a chimeric antibodies and a humanized antibodies, which contain even more human protein. And eventually, these days we tend to focus more on human. Antibodies that are produced with genetic engineered cell lines, and lastly, here are three examples of therapeutic antibodies that target a cytokine TNF alpha. So these anti-TNF monoclonal antibodies are actually quite old. They're infliximab, adalimumab, and enteracib. Some of the notable features of these monoclonal antibodies is that infliximab is a chimeric monoclonal antibody, versus adalimumab is a human monoclonal antibody. What is interesting for enteracib is that it is a fusion protein, which is a human、uh, TNF alpha receptor that is fused with. The stem of the antibody or the FC regions of the antibodies. So that is some of the notable therapeutic agents these days that are very widely used and is also indicated for a number of autoimmune diseases such as psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and many more. That is all for this particular lecture, and in our next lecture we will look at T cell. Receptor diversity. So stay tuned. I'll see you next time. Bye.